So we're starting on uh, doing the Bible study again. Um, I have a little trouble with the sound down at the office of the church, but I uh, tried it again today. It wasn't working. So I'm home doing the Bible study today, and we'll have it figured out hopefully by next week. Um, yeah, so anyways, there were some sound issues at the church. So we're going to get that sorted out. But uh, the, today I'm going to look at John 15, uh, 1 to 17. It's the uh, I am the vine text. And hopefully, uh, yeah, hopefully you'll get something out of it. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us this time to learn your word. We pray that your Holy Spirit will fill us so that we can bear your image and bear fruit. Amen. All right. So this particular text um, is a, a much beloved text, of course. You've all heard the I am the vine and you are the branches uh, text. It, one of the things that a lot of people may not know about this is I'm just putting it in here so I have it available to me. Uh, one of the things about this text that a lot of people will not understand immediately is uh, is who he's speaking to at first. He's, of course, speaking to first century Second Temple Jews. And Jewish people uh, had an incredible, uh, uh, vibrant imagery in their world that would describe things. And one of the things that uh, their world um, the descriptors of who they were comes from the Old Testament. And, of course, it's the vineyard. It comes out of Isaiah most notably out of Isaiah 5, um, where Isaiah the prophet is speaking of God, who's critiquing then the Israel who's fallen away. It's not Jesus isn't the first prophet type figure to come and um, critique the people of Israel for not living up to who they're called to be. So in Isaiah uh, 5, it starts off, let me sing a song for my beloved. It's this beautiful uh, song of the vineyard, my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones. He planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes. Um, and now inhabitants of Jerusalem, Jerusalem and the people of Judah judge between me and my vineyard. So now this is God speaking. What more was there to do in my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, it did not yield grapes. So you see this immediately that the fruit is the concern, the consideration, okay? So, and that's definitely what we're gonna see with Jesus. So he's using, he's definitely using this particular text as reference, all right? And then he talks about how he's gonna destroy the vineyard eventually um, if it doesn't repent, if it doesn't bear fruit. That's that critique. Secondly, we have the um, the Psalm 80, where you see uh, Jesus, actually, uh, God using the imagery of Israel as the vine. He says, restore us, O God of hosts, let your face shine that we may be saved. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. And again, it's a, um, the, the psalmist is using this as a critique of, the, of what's going on in um, ancient Israel. Okay, So uh, Jesus is obviously fulfilling those Old Testament texts, except what he's done differently here is he has put himself in as Israel personified. So he... Um, is now, of course, he's the God of Israel, as we've seen, and again and again, if you've been watching the sermons or the studies, now he's placed himself as Israel itself. He's going to fulfill Israel's mandate to be the people of God. In the ancient world, it wasn't unheard of for one person to represent a nation anyway. So this wasn't, um, uh, you think of David and Goliath narrative, where David, um, he says, listen, if I beat you, all you Philistines have to serve us and vice versa, right? Um, and in that sense, both David and Goliath represented their people as the king. So Jesus is representing his people as the king. He's also God, but he's also, he becomes now true Israel, who Israel was supposed to be. And he is now the vine rather than Israel as a nation. Now, this is an anti-Semitic. Um, in other words, Jesus doesn't come, and this is so important that I clarify this, because it can be misunderstood. Jesus doesn't come to create a new religion that is more for the Gentiles and then this, well, leaving Judaism as a religion for the Jews. What he does is he, he re-translates this around himself. He, he takes all of the Jews and the Gentiles and he all makes it Israel. It's the fulfillment of the promises of Israel. It's not that Christianity was in the ancient, you know, first century even seen as a separate religion. It was seen as a cult of Judaism. It's, it was seen as, listen, this is the promises that's gonna to happen to Israel. And 
Um, and the promises are always there that the Gentiles will come in, and Jesus is fulfilling that by being Israel, by reaching out and bearing fruit. All right? So he says, I am the ego of me. Again, this is this. Uh, this is his last of his seven I am statements. Um, but again, all of this, you know, the number seven, again, as you know, has so much power in Israel. It's, it has to do with completeness and divinity. And ego and me, of course, has to do with divinity. I am the true vine. So in other words, Israel itself has become the vine that's been torn up. The, the, the nation of Israel, he's talking about the temple cult and the structures within it who are uh, oppressing their people and killing and Jesus is saying, now I'm the true vine. I'm true Israel. I'm the true way, right? He's already said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he goes, my father is the vine grower. So you see this dichotomy here. I'm sorry, this um, relationship, this uh, this reality that the father and the son, though they're one, they're one, they have different roles, if you can use that, uh, personas. But they're the same. It's, it's the trinity. Good luck figuring that out. What's interesting is the word he uses, uh, and my father is the vine grower, is actually uh, the Jewish, comes from the Jewish word for gardener, which if Jesus is truly fulfilling the role of Israel and the God of creation, then he is absolutely the, the God who, who created the garden and the father is the gardener. Do you see how that works? He's the place where people find themselves created through. All right. Now, Jesus goes into this dialogue for his people. Now, this is for the church. This, this particular section is for people who choose to believe in him. This is not a narrative he's speaking to people outside of his discipleship group. Okay, so he's not even speaking about the Jews of his current situation. He's speaking to these disciples. He says, every branch in me that bears no fruit, he removes every branch that bears no fruit. So each branch will become a person of discipleship connected to the vine. And what he's saying is, if you do nothing, if you're, and this is a, a common warning within uh, this, um, and, and people can have debated how much, uh, you know, the old debate, can people lose their salvation? Uh, what, what I think what Jesus is practically uh, doing here is saying the truth, that if you don't bear fruit all through the Old Testament, if you don't live the God life, as I can, if you can have it that way, that Torah was directing them, and of course Jesus has shown us in person, then you are removed from the community because you're no longer part of the light and and that's what happens and that's a judgment so it's he who bears no fruit we're going to get into what that means every branch that bears fruit he prunes and this is another biblical concept that um you know dis discipline is not seen as bad in a to a christian uh, in our culture we don't like discipline we don't like the idea of a god who would direct us we were our culture really celebrates uh, idolatry um, and it celebrates self-idolatry and the idea that any person or thing might tell me how to act or do, um, of course, goes against hedonism, which is what our culture largely is. And But this God is a loving God. He realizes that we are given, our natures are not given to being perfect and uh, we, he, to, to get his fruit out there, he will prune and that can mean anything. That can mean the removal of something that you or I might love, um, but it's becoming an idol to us. Uh, you know, it can be all kinds of things. But this, so there is this reality. So if you're in the vine, this is a living God. This is not a, a dead God. This is a God who wants you to live his life uh, to make it bear more fruit. So his goal is to bear fruit. And again, we'll get to what that means. Um, now he says to the disciples, you've already been cleansed by the word and it's interesting he is the word so what he's spoken to them has already cleansed them he's already began the process of making them god people the people of god um because he's teaching them what the scriptures are about um and they've been cleansed and what's it's it's an indictment of course against first century second temple rabbis who are not cleaning the people because they're not teaching them the right way so you've already been cleansed by the word that i have spoken to you now he talks about this uh, he, he's still using the metaphor of the vine but you see that metaphors have uh, limitations. And in this case, he's talking to the branches as if they're uh, able to stay within the vine, like they have a choice. And of course, we know that's not the case. He says, abide in me as I abide in you. So now there's this living in. And it's interesting, now Jesus, who, who in John's gospel, he was God who tabernacled in, in creation, or he made his tent here in creation. Now he wants to put, make his dwelling in the people. So this is what people mean is Christ in you, is that's what it means, is he living by his spirit in your being. So he's inviting, and, and there's a, a, 
a verb kind of uh, emphasis here that there's a choice to be made. Are you willing to continue to live in this relationship, to have this God? Um, because if you don't, you won't bear fruit. And uh, that's, that's the call to faithfulness in spite of circumstance. Are you willing to stick it out? Um, that's what he's calling them. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So the fruit that he's looking for can only happen. There's a very low sense of, <laughs> of human nature coming up with beautiful uh, behavior to each other in Jesus. Uh, he's far too realistic to that. He recognizes that um, the only way uh, we can live out this faith is in a relationship with the God who created us. Um, and so unless we continue in that relationship, the fruit will not last. So he didn't notice he doesn't ask us to uh, continue in religion or get better ideas or philosophies. He's, he's very clear here. It's only in living this relationship, which I've been preaching again and again. So I am the vine, he says, you are the branches. There it is again. Uh, he reminds them. He says it again. That's a, that's a hint that we've got to really pay attention. He said it twice. Um, Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. Now he says, now it's not only you're going to bear fruit, but you're going to bear much fruit of what God wants us to be as the people of God. What he was critiquing Israel in Isaiah 5 is they weren't bearing fruit. That's why they were going to be torn up. The same warning is here. It's if you do not bear fruit, it's now on to the individual level rather than the nation. Um, because apart from me, you can do nothing. All right? Whoever does not abide in me, he says, is thrown away like a branch and withers. Uh, such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. In other words, they, they're destroyed. And... Um, there's always that warning in the prophets. There's nothing new here um, that Jesus is saying, if you do not live in this relationship with me, if you do not abide in me, you will be removed from this, uh, this living relationship that you can have. Um, and ultimately, there's a consequence. You will be outside the li of life itself, the, the living God, um, because you chose it. And what happens is you're destroyed. All right. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, he says, and it will be done for you. Now, this has, of course, been used badly by people who um, theologically are suspect in the sense that they uh, say, uh, if you want a, a new Corvette, pray for a new Corvette, and you can get it if you have enough faith. Or, or, or the health, you know, I'm talking the prosperity, parody, the prosperity stuff. But the whole idea is that you're abiding in Jesus so that your will is his. So you're not looking for selfishness anymore. So ask. Live this life. I, there's power uh, there's power in Christ. Um, he's a living God. Pray for the, for the fruit in your life. That's what he's saying, and it will happen. Um, yeah, so again, it's because you're abiding in Christ that you can get this fruit, and this is why prayer works. And it's interesting that it's almost like prayer is this lifeline um, to the vine, to the branches, sorry, from the vine. My Father is glorified in this. Okay, and that's the ultimate end for Jesus is in the gospel is always to glorify the name of God. And what that means is, Glorify, you glorify God by your actions. So you glorify God um, when you say, I'm a follower of God, and you act as God wants, and it glorifies his name. That's what that is all about. Um, but you don't bring shame. So that's what he's saying here. My father has glorified this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. So you become like I am, which is uh, lift up the poor, the weak, the broken. I love everybody. Um, Critique at times the uh, people and the things around you, if, if that's what you're called to do. But uh, to, to love, as we're going to see. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. So now you've got this relationality. Uh, it's all relationship language, isn't it? They've got the Father and Son in, in this relationship. They've loved each other. That's what abiding means, is that they love and care about. And he's saying that now this, this relationship is stretched back into the, the children of Adam, who's lost it in the garden. Now it's re come back. It's... Yeah, you know, and he says to Mary, uh, I go to my father and your father. That's Jesus' purpose on earth is to reconnect humanity to the living God, if they choose it. Now, that, that's that relational component in here is you have to choose to abide in it or or not. That, that's your choice. Um, and that's the beauty of God is he, though he wants everyone to be brought into this relationship, to have this eternal life, resurrection life, that he rec there's a recognition that uh, if he forced it, there's no relationship, right? There's uh, there's a sense of of God coming in Jesus Christ and saying, this is the way, but some people are going to choose out. And that's one of the great mysteries of Scripture, and I'm not going to get into it today. 
if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. So now he, he's saying he's given the commandments. He's talking about it all about being in his love, though. This is not religious commandments designed to make you a holy person, a spiritual person, or a moral person. These are commandments that are called that ultimate end goal is love. And that's what Israel at his time did not understand. They followed Torah to get an end goal, which was to have the Messiah come, to have uh, deliverance from Rome, from all these things. Many people practice religion in the sense, we talked about it on Sunday, of their business becoming better or having a nice relationship or even to go to heaven when they die. But for Jesus, he wants followers because of love. He wants followers who are going to come in and ask the ultimate question, is this loving my father? Is this bringing glory to him? And is this love loving my neighbor? And if you do that, he's saying, then you're, you're, you're staying in there. That's what my command is. It's all love-based. You abide in my love, just as my I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, which is to come and ultimately sacrificially die, which he's going to call the disciples to do. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you, which is a wonderful picture. So many religious people come in to the church and, and they look like they've sucked a lemon um, because they recognize that they're imperfect. We, they, they recognize all of these things. And God has become such a taskmaster in many religious um, situations and um, but I love that Jesus says this I have said this to you so that you so that my joy may be in you in other words that God wants us to be joyful think of that he wants us to be happy to, in, I don't like the word happy because it comes from happenstance with it, but he wants us to live in this joyfulness that uh, Bart used to say laughter is the closest thing to the grace of God um, there is a sense where God is not this angry, mean uh, villain. He's the one who brings joy and love. And I, I truly believe that when Jesus walked and went to those uh, feasts and hung out with, the, with his friends, he was joyful. Um, I should put a plug in. I've been watching the show called The Chosen. It's an interpretation of Jesus' life for sure. And uh, as a, a theologian, you're, you're, you're careful when you do that. But I would say that it's a good interpretation. I really like the Jesus. It's called The Chosen. You can get the app on, iPad, on Apple. I don't know about Google. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy and that your joy may be complete. He wants us to be full of joy. It's not wonderful that your joy may be complete. In other words, Christians were welcomed to celebrate and to have life and to um, be a blessing because how do you be a blessing when you're constantly sad or disappointed with yourself or feeling this God's angry all the time. There's a, Jesus is joyful. He brings new life. He breathes this thing because he's the God of life. He doesn't want little minions walking behind him with pouty faces. He wants people that have his love, his compassion, his joy. And when you see people's lives turn around, um, we need to preach that more sometimes. We in the Reformation tend to um, talk a lot about sin and not all, a lot about the grace that comes with it. And uh, we have to be careful. There is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. There you go. Now, how has he loved them? By choosing them, by sacrificing an ultimate heel die on a cross. So what he's actually calling for, where this joy leads to, is ultimately giving yourself over for others. And I'm going to talk about it on Sunday, but one of the things that I think COVID has brought, um, and it is certainly true right now especially, is people are really recognizing their need for community. They're really realizing that they are lonely, they're depressed. I think before we just got enough community that we could hide behind entertainment and we could hide behind other things. But now people are stuck in their homes and the, and, and the entertainment isn't fresh and new and even the sports aren't playing and all these things that can distract us. And what I think people are hopefully recognizing is the deep need for community, that the greatest gift we get is to be part of a community of people who believe as Christians, that we get to be a part of something where we get to love and be a part of it. Um, if if church is a chore, you've misunderstood church. And if church, and, and maybe it's because of the way we sometimes do it, we don't enhance the community, but that's what Alpha is so celebrated. I, I'm convinced it's not the videos. It's that people can come together and, and live true authentic lives together and, and celebrate joy together. So. He calls them to love as he loved them. No one has greater love than this. Then he says to, him to lay one's life down for his friends. So we can see that that's his goal. That's his life of life. In other words, sacrifice is the ultimate end of, of, I don't know they're going crazy. Um, 
Stop it. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, hopefully, I can't edit this out, sorry. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Um, so now he's changed. He's no longer uh, calling them slaves. He's calling them friends. Now notice they're, he's, they're his friends, but we can't claim that on our end because we don't, friendship kind of assumes an equality. He's come down into us and he's made us his friends. Folks, uh, the, the, the offer here is so incredible to be a friend of God to live with the living God in your life, to abide in that and have that. It's just so wonderful. That's what Jonah's gospel is about. Um, I do not call you servants or, or household slaves. It's the word doulos in the Greek um, any longer because the servant doesn't know what the master is doing, but he's told them he's going to die for them. He's going to uh, be lifted up, he says, in glory. Um, but he's also going to prepare a place. We talked about that last week. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I've heard from the Father. In other words, I have become your friend because I have brought God here to you. And that's the ultimate. He is the exegesis of God. He's the testimony of God. He is, he's it. There's no door number two. Um, and that is such a wonderful offer, isn't it? Um, and he doesn't say, again, I can't emphasize this enough. Do enough nice things. Be religious enough. Be spiritual enough. He says, abide in me. And this the abiding, he talks about it in the sense of, sense of prayer, living in that relationship. Obviously, the word, he talks about cleansing us. It's about learning the word, who Jesus is. It's about living in community with people filled with his spirit. That's how you abide in him. Uh, you did not choose me. Now, he, this is an important point. They are to abide in him, but they have no arrogance in this. This is God's choosing, and this is the mystery of the gospel. But I chose you and I appointed you to go bear fruit. So the reason he chose them is so that he might, they might go out. And what is this fruit? Is to be a light to the nations, to be a people who bring light, whether people want the light or not. And that doesn't necessarily always mean um, preaching at people. Um, in fact, I would argue that truly loving someone, you don't speak. I wouldn't speak until they believe that you love them. You show them love by... Um, sharing with them in community and sharing love with your neighbors and sharing um, who you are authentically and and ultimately that if they if they truly become friends of yours that the issue of your faith will come up and that's when you have that those great conversations and i appointed you to go and bear fruit the fruit that will last so that my father will give you whatever you ask in his name again the asking in his name he's going to give you whatever you want because you are abiding in him you have his heart for the people you have uh, his heart to bless, all right? I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. So his whole command is all about loving one another. His command is to live like him, abide in him, um, be in him. The only way we're going to live in true, authentic Christian community is, is to live in him. And the only way we're truly going to bring justice and life to the world is by abiding in him. The mistake that's happening right now in some wings of the church is they're focused on justice as they understand that, but they've taken Jesus out of the equation or he's put behind. Uh, I heard a, a, a preacher recently say, uh, we're constantly called to go out to the outer edges, the outer edges. And there's some truth to that, but actually we're, we're called to go in to Christ, to abide in Christ. In that abiding, we will get the heart for the lonely, the poor, and the broken. Um, we're not to abide in political parties. We're not to put our faith in political leaders. Um, we're there to be a light to the nations, to live in God. And that the more you live in God, the more that presence is available. So if you're not feeling like that presence is available, ask yourself, have I really been wanting it? Um, oftentimes people like the idea of God as long as he's, you know, stay a little bit away so I can do my own thing. Um, what Jesus is calling for here is something very different. Uh, he's calling for a uh, transformative life so you can transform others. So all right, I think I'll end it there. Bless you guys, and uh, I hope this is useful. If you're uh, um, at home, I bless you. I know it's hard right now. Uh, as for the um, situation, until the, I think it's the 7th or 8th, Tony Henry said, we will be staying, just doing our online stuff, and then we'll find out. I can't imagine what the numbers being what they are, that we're going to be going back soon. But we will keep providing. David and Sarah Jane are doing an excellent job. Yeah, providing Tom is doing a great job. Janelle, Janelle with the readers. Uh, Becky and Jason have been doing great music for us. So we'll still provide the service um, as best we can. Um, and they're doing a great job. And I will continue to do these Bible studies um, unless I get a sense that they're not needed. And then, you know, I'm not trying to force these. If these are helpful for you, 
uh, please let me know. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Well, and I hope to be back down in my office next week so I can get this sound figured out. All right, bless you.